chapter 15, Brother Norman led us in a responsive reading of that, those verses 1 through 14. We're going to focus in on verses 4 through 7 as we think today under this the overarching one anothering, living in a gospel community. All right. We're going to look at cultivating a welcoming culture toward one another. Last couple of weeks, we've looked at repenting and forgiving one another, repenting to and forgiving one another. We want to look today at, at, the, at what we would call hospitality and harmony. Our passage speaks to this. Are we a welcoming people? Do you, when you come into this place, when you gather here on these grounds, do you experience a, a welcoming by your brothers and sisters in Christ. When guests come among us, those who've not known us beforehand, do they experience that? Because the scripture tells us that's who we should be. It's one of the couple of the hallmarks of a new covenant community. Romans 15, 4 through 7. If you found that in your Bibles, would you stand with me, please? If you don't have a Bible with you, we're going to put the text on the screen so that you can see as well as hear the word of God. Follow along as I read this passage. We, pardon me, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And I pray that as we go through this today, we do, we do a sort of a self-examination. We can say we're a friendly church. But ask yourself, am I, what am I doing? Am I personally, intentionally, aggressively engaged in promoting a culture of hospitality in this place? Thank you. Please be seated. Well, you might think we've been going at this longer than we have. We've had some, we've had some, some breaks away from this thing. I think this is about the 14th or 15th sermon that I've preached on this theme. Now I want us to see in this passage today three things. The instruction of the scriptures as a way to help us cultivate a welcoming. The instruction of the scriptures. Secondly, the desire for harmony. And third, cultivating a welcoming culture. Look first of all at the instruction of the scriptures in verse 4. For whatever was written in former days, he's talking about the Old Testament, was written for our instruction that, there's a purpose clause there, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. Paul says, Everything in the Old Testament. He's a Pharisee, remember? That's his background. That's his training. He memorized the Tanakh. He memorized the Old Testament. It was one of the requirements in order to be qualified to be a Pharisee. And he says, whatever was written, everything that was written in the Graphe, the Holy Writings, was written with this in mind, this in view, for our instruction. Sounds very much like what he said in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 when he was writing to young Timothy, his son in the ministry. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. All of the holy writings are God-breathed, theonoustos, and are profitable are valuable when taken by us and received by us and applied by us produce 
fruit in us and fruit everywhere we go. For teaching, reproof, correction, for training in righteousness. That, there's a purpose called. In order that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The idea that instruction in the Scripture attended by the Holy Spirit produces in us endurance. It's the, it's the bearing with. It's the persevering. The Holy Spirit does that. He is the, he's the one who comes along beside. He's the comforter. And He carries us. He strengthens us. He encourages us as He lives within us. And how do we cultivate that? Feeding upon the Word, everything that was written before him. By the way, Peter, in his writing, assigned Paul's writings, the, half the New Testament, to this category. When he talks about Paul's writings being Holy Scripture. And of course, that's how you begin to build the idea of the canon. The 66 books we have. Instruction, teaching, produces, the word is abiding under. That's the word for endurance. How are you going to stay under that? How are you going to handle the load? The feeding upon the word, the instruction. And the encouragement. The word encouragement is actually built from the word for, that, for the, the description Jesus uses for the Holy Spirit, the parakaleo, when He comes, the Comforter. The Comforter encourages. He encourages by the Scripture. He enables us to endure. Paul says everything written beforehand had that in mind, headed toward the goal that through these things we would have hope. That confidence that no matter what this world is looking like, no matter what it seems to be turning into, that Jesus died, lived, died, rose again, ascended on high and is coming back. He is the blessed hope. We would have hope. This is not the same as I hope it doesn't rain later today. That's, that's a kind of a wishful thinking, a, a, a pondering what we'd like to be true. No, no. This, is, this hope here is an objectively anchored hope in who Jesus Christ is and what He came to do. And so the instruction of the Scriptures cultivates in us the attitudes, the approach to life that will lead to this welcoming community. You see, if you're if you're enduring, if you're not falling away, if you're not turning and running, if you're not, in, in Paul's day, if you're not abandoning the faith, if you're not confessing Caesar is Lord when called upon to do that, and, and in effect denying or rejecting Jesus is Lord, if you're persevering, if you're pressing on, and if you're finding it that a way to be comforted and encouraged, and you're focused on the hope, the blessed hope, things happen. In a church community. The second thing I want you to see is the desire for harmony. He's talked about this earlier in Romans. He says in verse 5 and 6, May the God of endurance, notice what he does here. He takes the two words that he said the scriptures were written to give us these things as the Holy Spirit applies them in us. And now he describes God this way. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you, give to you, to live in such harmony with one another. You see the one another there? He is the God called elsewhere in Paul's writing, the God of all comfort. As Joshua led us a while ago singing, He is a good, good Father. We can, we can come back to that. God is good all the time. All the time God is good. Some of, some of the folks say he's the God of endurance. So which is it? We've talked about this before in our confession of faith nestled next to one another in two consecutive 
a little chapter of paragraphs is assurance of grace and salvation, perseverance of the saints. And so we ask the question from time to time, so which is it? Which is it? Does God preserve us to the end or are we called to persevere to the end? And the biblical theological answer is yes. But we persevere because he preserves. And when we don't persevere, John had this to say in 1 John, they went out from us because they were not of us. For had they been of us, they would have continued with us. But their going shows that they were not of us. Paul, God preserves so that we persevere. One of my professors, I've said this to you dozens of times over the 15 years we've been together in seminary, said a faith that fizzles was false from the first. One of the marks of true faith is that it perseveres. May he, this God of endurance and encouragement, grant you to live in such harmony. The word harmony there is a word that means to have the same mind. Obviously, it's not suggesting that we think the same wrong things together. It's to have the same mind anchored in the truth. When the truth declares something, that our minds go, yes, that's, I, that's right. That's true. When the Scripture points out something is sin, we don't debate it. We go, yes. That's sin. The Scripture says it's sin. We agree. We have the same mind. When the Scripture calls upon us to rest in Christ and our justification, we say, yes, it's justification by faith alone and the finished work of Christ alone. When the Scripture calls upon us to progress, to, to pursue sanctification, pursue holiness, we say, yes, we must do that. That's true. It's the same mind. Clearly, and I don't know the church, so I'm not going to call the name now. But clearly a particular church in Ada, where a certain senator is a member in good standing, does not have the same mind. If they did, on the sixth commandment, they would call upon that man to do the right thing, or they would excommunicate him from the assembly. He has bloody hands. The scripture says, have the same mind to live in harmony with one another. And how do we do that? In accord with Christ Jesus. That is, as He calls us to be one. Remember what He prayed in John 17? Oh, Father, make them one. As you and I are one. He's praying that right now in heaven. So Paul is saying here, may this God grant to you, give to you by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, if you're saved, He's dwelling in you. And it's His desire that you and I have the same mind on the gospel. On what it is and what it means and what it looks like as we live it out. And here's the purpose statement. That together, in order that you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. The absence of this under the rubric of Christianity is killing us in America. It is killing our witness in America. When homosexuals can run for president and say that they're a Christian, when vile, perverted, wicked, evil people can operate under the banner of Christian, that's why I told you years ago, in heaven, I'll be glad to be called a Christian. On earth, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Trying to do what He says to do. Repenting of what he says to repent of. Cultivating what he says we should cultivate. One voice. Well, it's not going to happen right now. But it should happen here. That we have one voice. We speak as one voice. When we say, this is important, with one voice we say, Amen! This is important. When we say, this is sinful, this is wrong, we say, Amen! God, Deal with that. God, deliver me from that. When we say this constitutes sanctification, we say together, Amen. One voice. And that's how you glorify God. God is not glorified. When the angels look down from heaven upon Bethel Baptist Church, and they don't hear harmony, they don't hear symphony, but it's cacophony. 
It's, well, this, maybe that. No, I've told you before. And I've lost, I'm, I'm out of ways to say it. I'm out of ways to say it. This is not a cafeteria. It's a church. It's a church. And we gather. When we gather, it's a church. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings here, but I want to try one more time to say it plainly. We don't walk down a cafeteria line saying, hmm, I don't, I don't really feel like Bible study today. I, I, I don't want to pass on Bible. Yeah, I'm having, I'm having a little bit of worship. I don't, no, I'm, I'm stuffed. Evening study. That, that, there's no way I can handle that tonight. And then prayer meeting. You know, I, I just, I just don't get in. I, I don't have an appetite for that. This is not a cafeteria. It is a church of the Lord Jesus Christ, where Jesus is Lord, where He reigns upon this place. Having one voice and glorifying the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The desire for harmony. See, harmony is not, well, thank God we're not fighting about anything. That is not harmony. If you, if you went to a concert and the orchestra didn't strike a note. You would not leave there saying, well, thank God it wasn't cacophony. Thank God it wasn't a, a mixed noise. No, you would expect the orchestra, you would expect the conductor to raise his baton and when he comes down to hear symphony. Paul said it this way concerning the mind in Philippians 2, 5 to 8. I'm fixing to read a passage backward to you, so hang in here. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself. By becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Thank God Jesus did say, did not say, I'm really not into that. And Paul says, have the same mind that Jesus had, which is a mind of humility. It was a mind of self denial. It was a mind, it was not a mind pursuing his better desires and interests. And when he looks at the purpose, that you may with one voice glorify God. Look at Philippians 2, 1 to 4. The verse is immediately before this. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, now just read through this with me. You say, if you say, no, not really. Any comfort from love? No. Nah. Any participation in the Spirit? Well, nah. any affection and sympathy? See, if you're not getting any of these, the rest of this doesn't apply to you. But if there is encouragement in Christ, if there is comfort from His love, if there's participation in the Spirit in your life, affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, loving the same things, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, there it is again, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Harmony. A congregation in harmony. Oh, the power of that. Thirdly, cultivating a welcoming culture. You see, these things go into that. And if, and if these things are not present... You might as well have a hoe in your hand banging on rocks. But oh, if they are present, if they're in your heart. See, and the thing is, I can't say, well, are they in your heart? I gotta, are they in my heart? Are they in mine? And you can't say, well, I want to, you know, I'm glad so and so. No, what about me? Is it in my heart? 
cultivating a welcoming culture. It's easy to say we're a, we're a friendly church. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Remember last week we looked at forgiving one another as God through Christ has forgiven you. There's, there's the bar. There's the standard. You say, I can't, well, I'm as friendly as the next person. Doesn't get it. Doesn't matter. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. This, this theme seems to keep popping up in this passage. You see, the meaning of welcoming is to take to oneself, to receive. It's, it's just like, it's like harmony. You can't say about harmony, well, thank God we're not having any fusses and fights. You can't say, well, I wasn't mean to anybody. That doesn't get it. It means literally to take to oneself, to receive. See, when the Holy Spirit produces harmony in our lives, individually and then collectively as a church, apathy and complacency becomes a sin that everywhere it shows itself up, you want to take a hammer to it, drive a nail through it, and kill it. Because apathy... And complacence kill harmony and shatter any possibility of cultivating a welcoming culture. You may have read about the poll that was taken one time. Which do you think is the biggest problem that we face? Ignorance or apathy? Half the people responded, I don't know. The other half responded, I don't care. You see, and we can't claim, I don't know. Ignorance is off the table for us. Harmony produced by the Holy Spirit gives us this, this welcoming culture. And here's the challenge. I think, I think Paul lays it down to the Romans. Remember, he had not been to that church. So, so, I mean, he's saying some pretty bold things here for folks who who never met him. I mean, isn't he running the risk that, for crying out loud, they'll never ask him to preach there the way he's talking to them? Listen to what he says. As Christ has welcomed you. So, if you feel like Jesus has welcomed you half-heartedly, then you get some slack cut to be half-hearted. But if Christ has welcomed you unreservedly, if Christ has welcomed you completely, if He has taken you in, that's the standard, that's the measure, that's the model. Paul says we're to welcome one another. And it starts with the body of Christ, but it doesn't end with the body of Christ. And why should we do that? What should be our motivation? For the glory of God. Whether therefore you eat or drink, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, do all. To the glory of God. Glorify God. Paul says when, when strangers come among you, conduct yourselves in such a way that they will fall on their face and say, God is in this place. God is regnant in this place. The Spirit of God dwells heavily in this place. Do you want Bethel to grow? Are we a welcoming church living in gospel harmony with one another? Brother Norman Hare took us through a study several years ago. I don't remember how many years ago it was. It was wonderful material. It was on training us to be welcoming. People coming into a, a gathering of the church are expecting people to be friendly. I've, you've talked to people. You, in fact, you've been to places. Karen and I sometimes will visit places when we're on vacation and, and, and walk away thinking, as we come to worship, walk and thinking, that's strange. We, we could have not, as, just as well not been there and nobody would have missed our presence. You expect friendliness. And by the way, friendliness is in the eye of the beholder. This is sometimes we live in the forest so long we don't see the trees because we we take it as a matter of fact. And one fellow wrote, "If guests 
to our church don't think we're friendly, then we aren't, no matter how much we may think we are. We've taught you this before. Our God is a welcoming God. He's the one who sent. He, he's a giving God. He's a sending God. He delights. Hospitality is his idea. Even strangers among the Jews had a lot of, of privileges, even though they were not Jews. True, the Jews cultivated a, a snobby, bigoted attitude, but that was not in God's blueprints. That came out of their sinful heart. Do you practice welcoming more like a Pharisee or more like Jesus would have? Follow Jesus through the Gospels. There was not a more hospitable person in the Gospel. But you know who he was not hospitable to? The least hospitable people in the Gospels, the Pharisees. The welcoming heart of God was shown through the life of Jesus. When you extend a hand of greeting to one another, to a guest, you are practicing the welcoming spirit of God. If you were having someone over to your home, you would prepare for that. You, you would... You know, when we do that, Karen's cleaning things that she's content for me to live in when we're not doing that. Now, I know I, I didn't, I know you're wondering, well, where will you sleep tonight? Well, it, it's because and some of you are saying, well, well your hands can clean things too. And then, so I, I know what's coming. I'm just pointing out, and I'm not putting my wife down, but I'm just saying that that's the way we are. When we gather, when we gather here, we have, we have, by virtue of putting a sign out. By the way, have you seen our, our sign updated, cleaned up, lights, wonderful, beautiful. By, by a presence on the internet, by, by various means, we have said, we welcome you. The question I ask is, what preparation have you made, have we made, to demonstrate that we were anticipating you? Because you see, if we act shocked, surprised, frustrated, believe me, the person on the other end is just as shocked. And nobody voluntarily lets himself be shocked twice. Getting ready for company. It's an act of grace. We extend a hand. Those who are Christ followers and those who are not, we welcome. We need to be a great host. One of the ways we can do that, I'm going to go back to your home. Suppose you invited somebody over. You knew they were coming. They showed up. You showed up 10 minutes later. The message is what? Oh, I forgot you were coming. Which the message is, I didn't even think about you. You weren't even on the radar with me. No, one of the ways is you be sure that you're there early to greet the guests. When guests beat us to Bible study, we ought to be embarrassed. When guests beat us into worship, we ought to be embarrassed. Because the message is that they were looking more forward to it than we were. Be a great host. Tell you what, brother, we're going to teach this again. We're going to find a time on Sunday evening when we finish up this study, we're going to teach this again. Welcoming guests does not happen accidentally. It happens intentionally. In this study that Norman taught, it had a section on gesturize 
your church. Where we take intentional, proactive, preemptive steps to demonstrate that these folks are important to us. We told you back years ago when we were introducing this study that other than your salvation, the most important gift God gives to a church is first-time guests. And if we treat that like the child at Christmas does who seems to be more fascinated with tearing the wrapping op open than admiring and being grateful for the gift, then the tree is going to look pretty sparse at some point. Demonstrate a great attitude. There's a, there's, we learned in this study that Brother Norman took us through the 10-foot rule. Whenever you come within 10 foot of a person that you do not know, be sure and say hi. Greet them. Now, 10 foot's not, not very far. The 10 foot rule. We ought to make, make plans in many aspects to greet one another and greet our guests. And here's the deal see, when we practice greeting one another, makes us better at greeting everyone. Because in a congregation, though we have people assigned as greeters at the doors, the truth of the matter is, if you're saved by grace through faith and you believe the Scripture to be God's inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God, and we've just read this and He says, welcome one another, it means that we are all greeters. We're all greeters. Some have assignments for specific places, specific times, but we're all greeters. It's the, it's the, it's the nature of the Gospel working itself out of us. got some more stuff and we're out of time so here's what we're going to do we're going to make this a part two we're going to do a little deeper dive next Sunday when we celebrate the Lord's Supper communion community union we're going to do that It'll be a great time I think to reflect upon as we gather around the table of the one who welcomed us into his life by grace how can we more reflect Him. Because Romans 8 says that we are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. I haven't said one thing today to imply or insinuate that anyone here is unfriendly. That's not the message at all. The message is, what am I doing to intentionally, proactively, preemptively, cultivate a welcoming culture in this church. One last question we're going to dismiss. If I called upon you to name everybody here, could you? Okay, almost everybody. 90%. Could you? I'm not going to do it. Don't, don't, don't panic. Think about it. You see, if not, why not? Oh, move beyond that. How could I, Pastor? How could practice cultivating a welcoming culture? Reach out and say, man, I've been worshiping here X amount of time. I've probably heard your name. I ought to know your name. I'm going to repent of my sin. Please tell me again. I want to know your name. Because see, otherwise what we're doing, what we're doing is we're, dear God, bless so-and-so. And I think heaven says, which so-and-so are you talking about? It's a one another. Challenging us to do that. And I think when we take this challenge, I said it years ago, when we cultivate a welcoming culture, then this place becomes an incubator for God's works of grace. And He'll turn this place into a spiritual nursery.
but he's not going to drop his babies into a place where they're not going to be nurtured. You want Bethel to grow? It's not going to be by here. It's not even going to be by here. But it is going to be by here. With every one of us. Every one of us. Christ left the splendor of heaven, hung on a cross, naked, beaten, beyond recognition. He said, I want to welcome you to the family. And you're my disciples, he said, if you do whatever I've commanded you to do. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bow before you in Jesus' name. You welcomed us. Oh God, you welcomed us. You initiated it because we would never have sought you on our own. And Lord, we hear this word today. And I love these people. And I want us to experience the very best you have for these people, for this church. And I love what these folks know about the gospel. And I want this community to know what these folks know. And Lord, I know that, that the first hurdle we're going to have to clear is cultivating a welcoming culture. Committed to a harmony in the glory of God and not content that there's just not any fusses or fighting going on. We're committed to a harmony. Taking the scripture that we've been taught. These, this church for decades has had the gospel light brought to it before I got here by very capable preachers and teachers. Use the scripture to cultivate perseverance and hope to the glory of God, the cultivating of one mind, to make this place a spiritual nursery, a healthy nurturing place for spiritual babes to grow in grace. We thank you for our Savior lived, died, rose again, ascended, and certainly as we look around the culture we live in is coming soon. So we make our prayer in His name and for His sake. Amen. Let's stand together.